Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Our team's goal is to present science-based information about gardening and all things nature in New York's Hudson Valley. Host Gene and Tim, along with team members Teresa, Linda, and Annie, are master gardener volunteers for New York's Columbia and Greene counties. So if you're interested in gardening or nature or nuggets of information about what's happening outside your door, settle in. Enjoy the conversation. Whatever the season, we have something to say. In part one of our conversation with Paul Curtis, we talked about interactions with deer, coyotes, and black bear. In part two, Paul's extensive experience and insights guide us through a more in-depth exploration of the interactions between humans and other wildlife, like possums and raccoons, weasels and martens, skunks, and many more wildlife species in New York State. So I've heard different strategies for saving yourself if you run into a black bear. What's So I'm walking my dogs on my driveway at 11 o'clock at night and I encounter a bear. What's the best thing to do? The best thing to do is act large. And when we're trapping bears, that's what we do when we approach a trap site. Because sometimes there'll be, say, one bear caught in a trap and there might be two or three others in the family group that aren't. And so when we approach, we wave our arms, clap, yell, and that's usually enough to, to run off any animals that are there so we can handle the bear that we might have trapped for research Would purposes. the dogs scare them off or no? The dogs would typically scare them off, particularly if it's large enough and barking. Bears don't want to have anything to do with people for the most part. Okay. So as long as you act large and threatening, they're going to go the other direction. So you have a regular like mailman route of the dens you know to go to? Are these collared bears? Yeah, primarily the only way you're going to follow find a bear on a den site if, it's, if she's radio collared. Yeah. And so what we would do is trap bear during the summer months. The peak of breeding season for bears is in July. So we hmm. can trap bears during summer when the males and females are in sort of the, the peak of the breeding season. They're fairly easy to catch in the summer months, put radio collars on them then, and then follow them throughout the year until they figure out where their dens are in January, February and then go check the den if it's accessible. Uh, and I assume that data helps you understand how far they kind of roam, too. It gives us, having an animal radio collar gives us a lot of useful information. Whole range is one, how far they roam. Mm -hmm. Favorite habitat types, attraction to food sources, all sorts of data we can get by having an animal radio collar. Exposure to vehicle collisions or hunting pressure, a human cause mortality factor. Um, once the animal's radio collared, if if it's inadvertently killed, say, in a deer or a vehicle accident, then that collar usually will keep functioning. We can quickly find the animal and determine what killed it. Their dens sound pretty random. They don't go to the same den year after year. It's my experience from the Fort Drum study that they use different den sites each year. It may be in the same general area, but right. not the exact same location. Which makes sense, because if they're temporary shelters, then... He I got, I got got some blown down trees in my wood, so I, in the winter I probably shouldn't be going poking around there. Yeah, right? it wouldn't hurt to look. <laughs> but <laughs> but, but if, keep I your could, distance. It really wouldn't hurt to look. No. I could look, and if I saw if them, they wouldn't wake bear, up and kill me. No, the, <laughs> bear, throw the even dog if they at wake them. up, they're not going to kill you. They're going to run, and that's the oh. hardest thing when we're trying oh. to trap bear. Oh. Occasionally, <laughs> well, somebody will stumble across a den and report it to us, and we're studying animals, oh. and we'll want to go in and try to capture that animal in the winter. It's not collared already. Oh. So we have to use caution and sort of sneak up on the den site to try to see if we can get a good angle for a, a jab stick for darting or darting with a dart rifle to try to get some immobilizing drug. Uh, that, and that was what I was going to ask you. Is that how you is that how you call them? You do some kind of a, a tranquilizer yeah, thing? Yeah, they need to be tranquilized for, for their safety and our safety yeah. when we're handling them. And so if the animal's not already collared it, most of them bolt as soon as they know yeah. that you found their den, and they take off. And they're not collared. Sometimes you can track them on the snow, but that's usually not. Do, do you have a whole group of people who are doing this? I mean, do you have like a, a staff of people who are tranquilizing the bears? Or? No, anymore. Currently, I'm not involved in any bear research. It's, it's DEC, I assume, right? DEC, a lot of that. DEC does the bulk of the work on uh, 
deer and bear. They have the primary management responsibility in New York State. We partner with DEC when there are specific questions and okay. research uh, questions that they have that, that we can help them study, those type of things. And there's no other bears besides the other species besides black bears, right, in New York State? East of the Mississippi, it's, yeah. it's only black bear. Yeah. We were talking today about fisher cats. They're terrifying. Well, they, to well, us, but I don't know well, if they're terrifying. Well, I think terrifying. they are to just about everything else out there. And then the whole weasel family in general. Yeah, can you talk about that and kind of what the populations are? Because I know like Adirondacks, there are certain species, and, and south of the Adirondacks, there are different ones, right? Well, uh, there's only one really fisher in New York State. And it used to be years ago, 20 years ago, the, you'd see them in the Adirondacks and in, in the North Country. But now the fish are relatively common yeah. throughout central and western New York. You see the same trend with bobcats. It used to be, and like we talked about earlier, extremely rare to see a bobcat in central and western New York. And now we see them frequently on our trail camera. So it's these medium-sized carnivores, uh, the fishers, the bobcats, uh, foxes, seem to be doing fairly huh. well. And the populations are expanding in central and western New York. Are there martins, too? Are they... There are martins, uh, pine martins, and, uh-huh. uh, but those are uh, in more high elevation areas. So that's maybe what I'm thinking of, kind of further north. Further north, see high elevation. And, and how do weasels relate? I One of my dogs killed a weasel, and I didn't even know what it was. I had to look it up on iNaturalist, but it killed a weasel. Is that pretty uh, unusual? Do I have a super dog? <laughs> you don't see dogs interact with weasels all that often. Yeah. They're usually pretty agile and pretty yeah. able to escape escape a dog. Maybe it was already dead. No, no, I have a fast dog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, he's a very fast dog, and th- there was something hanging around in my fenced in area, and he killed this weasel, and I didn't even know. It was a, it's a really pretty animal. I mean, yeah, Beautiful animals. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they were an important fur bear, and still are essentially a fur bear, so pelt can be sold. Uh, but basically, the only time I hear anything about weasels is if you know, people have got small poultry in the backyard huh. and, mm, and weasels yeah. will get in and occasionally take poultry, but otherwise they call very, cause very few conflict with people, so you usually don't hear much about them. So martins and weasels and this the, the animals and these families, it's not something that a homeowner needs to really be that concerned about then. Mm-hmm. They're, they're there and they're predators, and I assume they're eating things like mice that spread ticks and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Homeowners rarely need to be concerned about anything in the mustelid family. Uh, they're they're more in natural habitats and rarely come into the into the home lawn and create conflicts. And are they they more in like water environments, like creeks and streams and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, definitely. That's things, where I always see them. Yeah, definitely. Measles and or weasels and minks and things like that are definitely more attractive. And to, there are minks. There oh, are yeah, minks as minks well. Minks are very common. Same family. Yeah, huh. same mustelid family. Yeah. Most common place I see manx are in riprap along shorelines. Like I was fishing up on a Nina Lake a year ago and casting offshore on this rock pile, and all of a sudden a mink appears with a bluegill in its mouth and oh. oh. cotton. Oh, that's kind of cool. Foraging, so that was kind of neat to see. Wow. I mean, the other thing that I see a lot of are possums and raccoons, of course, and they're they're kind of ubiquitous across the state, right? Yeah, that's correct. And the thing about raccoons is they're our primary rabies vector species in New York State. So homeowners need to be aware of that. We don't want to be attracting raccoons into the landscape inadvertently because by far and away there's more rabid raccoons than any other mammal in, in New York State. Number two would probably be that group would be the second most common rabbit species. And how would we attract them inadvertently, like head leaving corn feed outers? I mean, do they eat bird feed? Like, what's the way to kind of prevent having a lot yeah. of raccoons? Yeah, you know, people will, for example, put food scraps in a compost pile. That's yeah. going to attract raccoons. Feeding pets out on the deck and then leaving the food out there, that's going to attract raccoons. Any type of, of food attraction like that could attract bears, raccoons, coyotes in the places where you don't want them. Okay. Everybody's hungry. Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And possums, I mean, I love possums. I think they're kind of cool, but they're very slow moving at times, right? You, I mean, you see a lot of roadkill in the spring when they're kind of first waking up, right? Yeah, you see quite a few roadkill. And the same with skunks early in the spring. Right. You see quite a few right. roadkill. Possums, I almost never get a call about because there's very little interaction with people. Right. Skunks, on the other hand, everybody's concerned about the, <laughs> o- about the odor. And again, if you remove food, Attracted from the environment, that'll potentially reduce conflict. But often with skunks, 
The biggest issue I see is grubbing in spring. When the lawn's mm-hmm. wet, they'll get in the, in the soil and dig trying to, to locate grubs. And I think that's good. Well, could be. Some people don't like to see their lawn torn up. But what I tell folks is, you know, if it's not too extensive, treat it like a divot on a golf course yeah. and put the grass back in, tamp it down, and it's spring. If it's rain, the lawn will heal itself. And often the, the skunk that might be doing the damage in your back lawn may be living under your neighbor's shed three houses <laughs> away. So that means you're not going to be able to do a lot about it unless you can work with your neighbor and potentially handle a nuisance wildlife control person to trap that offending skunk. Again, they're a rabies vector species, so anybody handling any mammal at all should have rabies pre-exposure immunization. I, I'm required to have that for my work. So skunks are rabies vectors. They're also yeah. rabies vector and, species. And, and I guess what happens if you get bitten by one of these animals? Do you need to go to the, a doctor immediately? You need to go to a doctor immediately and also you're required to report to uh, Department of Health, County Health Department. And the County Health takes some regulatory control and will mandate what happens. And if you're bitten and they don't have access to the animal for rabies testing, it's invariably it's going to require a rabies post-exposure treatment. They still do those horrible series of shots? They still do shots. It's not as horrible as it used, as it used to be. And <laughs> even the pre-exposure ones aren't aren't that bad nowadays. Oh, because it used to be you had a, what, a shot in your stomach and yeah, a that, series that, of them and stuff. Yeah. It's yeah. awful. Yeah, that's, that's long gone. Oh, um, good. Not that I'm planning usually to get bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for the rabies pre-exposures, I remember my mine years ago now, I was two intramuscular shots a certain time frame apart. Huh. My antibody titer's been good. I have to get my antibody titer checked every two years to make sure oh. I still got protection. Interesting. Oh. And is there a is there a cure all if your dog gets sprayed by a skunk? Is there something? <laughs> what What do you do? There is no cure all. There's a, <laughs> actually a couple anecdotal remedies that uh-huh. are available. I'm trying to remember the one. It's got soap, hydrogen peroxide. I can't remember what the other ingredient is. Something you, that you Google, probably. <laughs> something that you Google. Yeah. I've got readily, it on my fridge. Yeah. I'll okay. It's readily available online. You it can is. Google okay. it. And if you can sort of rub down uh, the uh, fur of the animal with that, it will help because it's an oxidizing agent. Not going to make it perfect, but I it will Professor help. I love Professor Curtis telling us to Google a home remedy. <laughs> you heard it here first, yeah, right? I'm in trouble now. <laughs> yeah, you are boy. in trouble. <laughs> and just back to possums, right? Like, if, if, are possums rabies vectors, too? They can carry rabies, but it's extremely less common in possums. I'm not quite sure why. They and probably can't figure out how to bite you with all those million little teeth. Yeah, that's not the problem. I no, don't no. Think. They have really scary teeth. They do. They've got a mouthful of yeah. teeth, but they're very non-aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, again, I'm going to give you my dog anecdote story where I had <laughs> dogs go after a possum. Everybody wanders into our yard and the, the possum played possum, right? Which they do, right? That's yep. something that's not, that's not a myth. It really happens. And they left it alone. Yeah, that's sort of an innate behavior. Once they get stressed out, they just play dead yeah. and hope that the... I don't think they were you. playing. They just, like, dropped dead, and then they were gone after that. <laughs> so so that's not something you really need to worry about. Again, if you have pets or kids, you don't really need to... I'm asking all the worried questions, but right. that's... Right? Yeah, for most wildlife species, uh, unless you get a, a rabid animal, that's sort of the exception to the rule. If you keep children and pets away, let the animal go about its behavior, it will leave on its own accord. The sort of the exception to the rules when you get something like a rabid fox and they right. get really aggressive and they will chase and bite and you really got to take cover and do what you can to try to get that animal addressed. I mean, would you know that if you, I mean, it would be pretty clear, I would assume, if that animal is rabid that, that it's it's aggressive, right? Yeah. And some species tend to show more aggressive behavior when you're rabid. Some don't. So you can't say definitely it's rabid, but if you see a really aggressive fox, it's probably rabid and then should be euthanized humanely and then tested by the local health department and particularly if there's any interaction with people or pets. And, and since we're talking about foxes and I'm back to my dogs, you they get mange a lot, right? So you want to be careful letting your dogs near a fox hole. Is that true? Yeah. Foxes do get mange. I would say a lot. Coyotes also get mange. And so, again, you probably want to limit interaction between your dog and either coyote or foxes for a variety of reasons, not just mange, but right. other potential diseases and things like heartworms and things like right. that. Oh, that they, they can get all of that yeah, from them? Yeah, coyotes huh. can carry heartworms too. In fact, in, when we were, other than the human cause mortalities, heartworms were one of the big mortality factors of coyotes in New York State because obviously really? they're not 
treated like right. we treat our domestic dogs. Huh. Oh, I that brings another coyote question. Now, they didn't exist in New York State until however many years ago, and they all traveled from across the country in different blends, and there's coyote dogs. What's the real story about all of this? Yeah, we have eastern coyotes in New York State, but we've got two source populations. Probably the first incursion of coyotes in New York State came across the St. Lawrence River out of southern Canada in the 1930s, 1940s, based on trapping records and data. And from there, they spread down both sides, the Adirondacks, and filled back in through, through the Adirondack. There was a second incursion that came across the Midwest through Ohio and Pennsylvania over towards Chautauqua County and came in the western part of New York State. So we've got this mixing area in central and western New York State. And Dr. Roland Kays was the state uh, museum in North Carolina when he was in New York, did a number of interesting genetic studies of coyotes. And that's sort of where this term coy wolf came up. Right, coy wolf. Yeah. Well, they're really eastern coyotes. The ones in the eastern part of the state are slightly larger than those that are in the western part of the state. And the genetics are different between the eastern and western part of the state. When coyotes came across southern Canada, they interbred with a wolf there. We don't know exactly what the wolf was. It probably was not a gray wolf. Uh -huh. But if you look at some of the old historic settler accounts, they talk about things like brush wolves. Well, what's a brush wolf? Probably it was a lot like the red wolf in North Carolina, a smaller version of the gray wolf. And coyotes rarely interbreed with red wolves in mm. North Carolina. And that's one of the biggest challenges to try to conserve red, roads, red wolves, uh, which is an endangered species, is to keep coyotes away. And so anyhow, eastern New York and central New York coyotes picked up some of this wolf DNA. So they tend to have slightly larger head size, probably adapts them more to take deer than their western counterparts from uh, the mm -hmm. prairie states, which more were adapted to take rodents. But they're all eastern coyotes. They all interbreed readily. And even though they do carry a small amount of wolf DNA, particularly in the north and eastern part of the states, they're really eastern coyotes. Huh. And, and, and is, there any, is there any issue with domestic dogs breeding with coyotes? Domestic dogs breeding with coyotes rarely, rarely could happen. We had over 40 radio collar coyotes in our Westchester County study over a three-year period, and we only had one interaction ever with a dog. Huh. And the homeowner was very upset about that and called us. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't think the, the coyote actually ever bred. But it was. It was a, a male-female pair of coyotes. They had a whole range established not far from where the interaction occurred, and the male was real killed right during the peak of, uh, breeding season in the winter months. And so all of a sudden the female came in estrus and she didn't have a mate. Uh -huh. And so she started hanging out in backyards and uh -huh. started checking the dogs out. And uh, homeowners got very upset because, again, they were concerned about rabies right. transmission and other diseases. But as far as we know, there was never any negative interaction. As soon as breeding season was over in two weeks, she never cavorted with a dog again. Uh -huh. So I think it would be extremely rare. Because coyotes, again, are very territorial. They yeah. don't want any other canids. Yeah, be more competition. Yep. I love that turn of phrase. She never cavorted again. <laughs> okay. Well, we went through all of our top ten or however many. What's your favorite wild critter if we missed one? I think you've covered pretty much all of them at this point. <laughs> Woodchucks. Oh, Teresa's favorite. Woodchucks. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah, the, the garden the nemesis. Gar the the garden, totally the garden nemesis. <laughs> yeah. So woodchucks are extremely difficult to deal with because they're in the scaredy family, which means they're scary. big gr ground squirrels. Okay. Oh, so, oh they, so that's a ground squirrel? Because people talk about ground squirrels, and I thought it was a myth or something. No, there, there really, really are a, ground huh. squirrels. Okay. Yeah. And so like out west, you have 13 lane ground squirrels. Right. Here in the east, we've got eastern chipmunks, which are a type of ground squirrel. You've got woodchucks, which are a big ground squirrel. So they're related, chipmunks and, gr and oh, woodchucks. Oh, not closely. Uh, okay. But they sort of fall in that sort of same grouping of rodents. So because they're ground squirrels, they burrow very well. Mm -hmm. They climb very well also. And so it makes it extremely difficult to fence them out of an area like your garden. Yeah, you know, because they'll either dig under the fence unless you've got a shelf, an L-shaped shelf buried underground so they can't dig under, or they'll just climb over. I've seen... In some of our fruit research trials years ago, we had uh, a cherry trial. We were finding all these broken limbs and stripped 
branches of chariots. Oh, these darn raccoons are in here. And so that's what I assumed. And so I set a bunch of traps to try to save the trial. I ended up catching as many woodchucks as I did raccoons, and they were up in the trees, oh, too, stripping I the fruit out. didn't know they climbed trees. They Picture that climb crowd. trees very, very huh. readily. Yeah, I've seen them climb. Which makes me, so is there anything you can do about woodchucks besides trapping them or, you know, Teresa's out shooting them probably, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, fencing is the best long-term solution, but it takes a pretty solid fence. Again, you've got to have a, the L shape underground so that they can't burrow under. It helps if you've only got a three-foot high fence to put an electric wire on top or on the side so they can't climb over. But if you do it, you can keep the woodchucks out. A simple, inexpensive fence works for home gardens. Mm-hmm. I use a two-wire electric fence with electric poly wire or poly tape with strands like 6 and 12 inches above ground, and that will reduce most of your woodchuck problems. It seems like we had a cabbage trial at the Ag Experiment Station in Geneva years ago, and once we put the two-wire electric fence up, it virtually eliminated huh. the woodchuck problem. So it's not that expensive to do for a couple hundred bucks. You can get a good fence charger and some fiberglass poles and insulators. So it's, it's fairly economical. And the nice thing is if you've got woodchucks and raccoons, it'll keep both about with the wires of 5 and 10 inches. If you've got deer that are near your your garden, add a third wire at 30 inches and then put cloth strips about every 4 or 5 feet on the water and spray the cloth with a good odor-based deer repellent, something like something that's got putrescent egg solids as an active ingredient, and that'll help keep deer out of your garden too. Okay, I got one more now that we talk about climbing <laughs> trees. What about porcupines? We were just talking about that the other day. They're pretty rare, right? But they do They're not climb. rare. They're, They're just mostly night active. They're ah, primarily not okay. carnival, so people don't see them all that frequently. Okay. They're actually fairly common in more areas with larger wooded habitat. Okay. For example, at our Arnott Teaching and Research Forest just south of Ithaca, you know, 20 miles or so, we see signs of porcupines. We've actually got photos of porcupines, and so they're there. But they're again being night active. Most people don't run into them. It's not something you need to. It's not again, unique at Worry all. about or be unique. Well, they're not then. a pest. Well, the only time they get into pests is when they chew wooden structures. Sometimes uh-huh. they're attracted to uh-huh. the glues and like fiberboard and wood. Uh-huh. You know, particularly sort of more remote cabins and woods area, they'll get in and chew a deck or they'll chew uh-huh. a wooden wall on. So that can be an issue. And you don't have complaints about them having interactions with dogs? Once in a while, we yeah. get one that has an interaction with a dog, and it's usually very sad because yeah. a dog gets the worst in it. Yeah. It's very deck. expensive, yeah. too, I might add. Yeah, mm-hmm. very expensive and painful for the dog. There's mm-hmm. nothing really to prevent something like that, I assume. Only having control of the dog and dog on a leash, it usually happens when the dog's off leash and how yeah. the owner's control. It's always the owner. Owner's fault, you know. It's not Pretty the dog's much. fault. Um, yeah, I've I've been told that in dog training that it's my <laughs> fault, not the dog's fault. <laughs> so we always ask this question. I don't know how much it relates, but I assume it relates. Is like I always ask the question: with so much going on in the environment and negative news, what gives you hope when you see day to day all these animals? So look, what's your hopeful message for folks? Yeah, what really gives me hope are the students. That I work with from day to day on campus. I mean, they're bright, capable, super enthusiastic, and the students we work with now would be our next generation of leaders. And then the many colleagues I work with on and off campus are really devoted to promoting biodiversity conservation and trying to make the world a better place. So that gives me hope too, even though there are so many negatives out yeah. there nowadays that people are working to try to make the world more sustainable and address these things. So, so do you think the students are going to solve our problems? A lot of the students are brighter than I am, so my fingers are crossed, and hopefully they will come up with some solutions. That sounds good to me. You are just so knowledgeable about this. This We so thank you for coming here, and I'm sure everybody learned a lot. I certainly did. Thank you so much. I'm oh, glad to do it. That concludes another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. We would like to thank Sandra Powers and Devin Connolly from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties for production support. And a special thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley.
You can find links to any of the topics mentioned in this episode at our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org. Comments and suggestions for future topics may be directed to us at columbiagreenmgb at cornell.edu or on the CCE Master Gardener Volunteers of Columbia and Green Counties Facebook page. For more information about Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties, visit our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org or visit us in Hudson or in Acre. Cornell Cooperative Extension provides equal programming and employment opportunities 